Good morning, good morning. How's everyone doing this fine day? So I'm moving into chapter 35. Yeah, I'm trying to tackle the first eight verses here today. Let's start with a prayer. Dear yeah, Heavenly Father, oh, Lord, thank you so much for all the things that you help us with and that uh, we can be here together uh, with these fine folks online uh, to uh, uh, be with them also and be with their day and that we can all start off the day together in a great message uh, th through your word and help us to uh, be ever uh, learning and understanding your word and help us with that, Lord. In Jesus' precious name I pray, amen. Okay, call this when Jacob moves to Bethel. As a reminder, this is what God originally had uh, had told him he was supposed to do. And so he's uh, kind of getting, uh, he was backslidden there a little bit, you might say. And now he is uh, hopefully being able to gonna lead his family. Uh, not perfect, nobody's perfect, but that uh, he's realizing that uh, he needed to uh, readdress and get back to where God and wanted him to be. I think we all face those journeys ourselves. So let's take a look at this. Some verses here. And uh, start up here in verse, a little preview here I got wrote up. Uh, Jacob has realized due to, hi to him and his family's backsliding that it was time to turn back to God. Remember, we just left the last chapter, a very disappointing chapter. A lot of death and destruction, uh, necessarily over, over, over something that could have probably been uh, uh, understood a little bit better, rather than immediately jumping to wrath. But it's time to turn back to God, and as we will see, He had all pagan worship items, as it seemed, were collected by His children, His wife, gods of her father, buried and left to His land of Shechem. Seems God will also protect them from the wrath of the people of that region, uh, which we can apply to our lives too. When we realize that we have sinned and have backslidden, uh, we too can receive forgiveness. And as Jesus quotes two separate stories, and we're gonna start off with those two stories. Uh, we see that one's in John 5, and the other one's in John 8. We'll see that both topics of these stories were poor lifestyle choices. And to basically change from that lifestyle and your your lives will honor the Lord. Now I'm sure due to the flesh that they will sin again, as we all do, but we should strive to improve our mistakes and try to be more like the Lord. Uh, each time we learn the lesson from the Lord. So I just mentioned uh, Genesis 35, one is where we're starting off. Uh, the wife hath not power over, no, oh, And God said unto Jacob, Arise, go to Bethel, and dwell there, and make there an altar unto the God. And, they, and that and that appeared unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau, their brother. So let me bring in the map here. And again, where we're starting right now is that uh, they're up here in Shechem, and they're going to be heading down to Bethel. And this is the original place that God had intended for them to go. So I want to tell you these two stories first. Uh, the two of them might be sound familiar to everyone. Uh, it was in John 5, and I'm going to read 2 through 9, and then uh, 14 and 15. Kind of jumping around a little bit uh, just to get the flavor of the story. Now there at Jerusalem by the sheep market, a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In, in these lay a great multitude of uh, impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. I want you to realize that this place was not of God. Uh, and you might see the word angel here, but uh, I think that the angel in this particular case is, a, is from the, uh, the fallen angel side. Jesus went here to meet a man, and that most uh, commentaries I've ever read on this particular one is this pool of Bethesda was not, they were, they were wishing for the, the, the tribulation of the water to, to allow them to, it was like a race uh, to get to the water and whoever got there first supposedly got healed. Uh, again, the Bible doesn't speak of anyone ever getting healed by that water, number one. And number two, God doesn't work that way. Uh, it's not like a lottery contest. But Jesus went there specifically for one particular individual and that's who we're talking about here. 
But the angel went down at certain seasons into the pool and troubled the water. Whoso then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatever disease he had. And a certain man was there, which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. And when Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been there and been now a long time in that case, he said unto him, well, Wilt thou be made whole? And the impotent man said, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another step is down before me. And Jesus said unto him, Rise, take up thy bed and walk. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. I'm going to leave the rest because it turns into a little debate about uh, what you should do on the, the Sabbath and what you should not do. I want to get the flavor of this because I'm going to jump to verse 14. And then Jesus leaves this particular area at this point. And the man doesn't really even know who it is. So jump into verse 14. And afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole, sin no more, lest the worst thing come unto thee. This is the part I wanted to kind of point out. And the man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him whole. You notice Jesus said there, and sin no more. See, he was he was wishing, he was he was using a pagan type uh, atmosphere to try to solve his problem instead of turning to the Lord. Uh, and so that's it. Uh, so that's kind of what I'm hinting at here with these two stories. And these are people that uh, uh, that Jesus had specifically told to sin no more after they had uh, had been sinning. But I also want to state that it's, that it's based on a lifestyle. They, they chose this. This man was there 38 years trying to get whole again at this pool instead of reaching out to the Lord himself or, or making his life as, as good as possible in the state he was in. Uh, and the other one is in John. This is the famous one uh, where Jesus uh, meets the uh, woman who was caught in adultery. It's John 8, 3 through 11. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in, in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. I might want to point out here that uh, in Jewish law, adultery, both the man and the woman, where if they were caught in adultery, was supposed to be stoned to death. But notice the Pharisees only brought the woman. Uh, so I'll point that out right here. <coughs> now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have a, have a re, uh, might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground, as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted him up himself and said unto them, He that is with, without sin among you, let them cast a stone at her, cast a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Nobody knows what, exactly what Jesus was writing on the ground. Some, some speculate that he was writing their sins on the ground uh, so they could the, he could see them. I kind of suspect that uh, it's a symbolic of uh, Jesus was the one I believe that was on Mount Sinai and actually with the finger of God wrote the Ten Commandments. So I have a feeling that uh, he might have been writing out the Ten Commandments using his finger and that they would know this, uh, they would correlate maybe the two. About the uh, Ten Commandments being written with fingers of the finger of God. Okay, go on to verse 9. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman! Where are those that uh, thine accusers? Hath no man to condemn thee? And she said, No man, Lord. And uh, Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. So again, he basically said the same thing here. Sin no more. And you can take that. that uh, uh, I'm sure that uh, he didn't expect her necessarily to never ever sin again. But at least that, uh, that she, he was hoping that she was going to change her lifestyle and not and not result in using her body uh, for gain. Uh, she might have been somebody who was uh, uh, 
committing adultery with somebody because of the power they had or whatever. We don't know. Uh, but uh, I think here this is what Jesus is driving at. And we're going to see this, the basic same thing in this story uh, that I'm going to uh, hear in Genesis. So I wanted to share those two stories that really popped out at me when I was reading this, this passage. So let's see how Jacob proceeds to cleanse his family and honor God once again. So, uh, so again, I'll just reread verse 1. And it says, And God said unto Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel, and dwell there, and make it there an altar unto God that appeared unto thee when thou fleetest from the face of Esau their brother. And I'll just uh, comment back to that. He's commenting back to a period of time uh, when God first met him here. And that was back in Genesis 31, 13. I am the God of Bethel, where thou anointest the pillar, where, where thou vowest a vow unto me. Now arise, get thee out from this land, and return unto the land of thy kindred. This is the original marching orders that God had given him to go to Bethel. But he stopped in Shechem, and that's where he got into kind of a, a little bit of a trouble. Okay, verse 2. And Jacob said unto his household and to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you, and be clean and change your garments. Because this is put away the, uh, uh, the, store, uh, the strange gods that are among you. And I'll just go through a few verses on that over in Exodus 20, verse 3 and 4. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt no make no other no thou shalt make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water underneath the earth. Also uh Exodus twenty three, thirteen. And all things that I have said unto you be circumspect, and make no mention of the name of other gods, neither let it be heard out of thy mouth. Also twenty three twenty four. Thou shalt not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do any after their God, uh, works, but thou shalt utterly overflow them and, and quite break down their images. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 5, 7. Thou shalt have none other gods before me. Deuteronomy 6, 14. You shall not go after other gods or gods of the people which are round about you. Okay. So even before, I, I want to point out that uh, I just read through the formal commandments that were given to Moses on Mount Sinai. But you notice here that, uh, that uh, Jacob is also telling his family basically the same thing. So that this law was put into the, uh, to the hearts and minds of the people even before the law was written down on, on stone tablets on Mount Sinai. <clears throat> so even though uh, Jacob was taught these truths, and talking about cleansing garments, uh, over in Job 1.5. And it was so when the days of their feasting were gone about that Job sent and sacrificed them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings accounting according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job and continually. Job was the oldest book of the Bible, uh, even before Moses wrote the, five, the first five books. And so we can see here that even Job uh, was uh, was doing sacrifices uh, prior to the law was given, uh, so it's been, it's always been a requirement to have some sort of a uh, uh, worship and sacrifice unto the Lord. Also in Psalms fifty one two, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. That's our goal. That's our that's what we should be heading for. Okay, Genesis thirty five three. Let us arise and go up to Bethel, this is Jacob speaking, and I will make thee an altar unto God, who answered me in the day of my distress and was with me in the, in the way which I went. So a verse on this over in Genesis 28, 20, reflecting back a little bit. And Jacob bowed a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go, and I will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on. Okay, Genesis 35, 4. <clears throat> and they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hand and all the earrings which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the oak which was by Shechem. So he took all this uh, this foreign uh, idol worship stuff and included earrings. 
realize that these earrings aren't just regular you know, earrings like women wear today. Uh, these earrings actually had meaning. Uh, these, these rings were not worn as mere ornaments, but for superstitious purposes, perhaps as amulets or charms, uh, first consecrated to some false god or formed under some constellation and stamped with magical characters. Marmon Ludes mentions uh, rings and jewels of this kind uh, with the image of the sun, moon, etc. Impressed upon them, and uh, Augustine described them also in his writings as used for the uh, uh, a purpose, for basically worship purposes and for uh, superstitious type purposes. So Hosea 2.13 speaks on this also. And I will visit upon him the days of Balaam, which she burned incest to them, and she decked herself with earrings and her jewels, and she went after her loves and forgot me, saith the Lord. So this is not necessarily a, uh, a, a verse against earrings in general. It's against having any kind of like lucky charms uh, or anything that you form into an idol. So he hid them, uh, kind of interesting. He hid them in Shechem. Got some verses on that too in Isaiah 2.20. In that day a man shall cast his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which they made each one for himself to worship, to the moles and to the bats. And also jumping uh, down to Isaiah 30, verse 22. You shall defile also the covering of any graven image of silver and the ornament of molten images of God. Thou shalt cast them away as a menstrual cloth. Thou shalt say unto it, get thee hence. So not necessarily the same oak, but interesting tie to the future time. Uh, uh, yeah, talking about the oak trees, uh, it's interesting that... Uh, when Joshua comes into the land, he talks about Shechem and he talks about an oak tree. Now look at over at Joshua 24, 25 and 26. So Joshua made a covenant with the people and set them a statue and an ordinance in Shechem. And Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God and took a great stone and set it up under an oak uh, that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. I find that kind of interesting. I wonder if it was the same oak tree or, or maybe Shechem has a lot of oak trees. <clears throat> And Joshua said unto all the people, Behold, this stone shall be a witness unto us, for it hath heard all the words of the Lord which he spake unto us. It shall be therefore a witness unto you, at least you deny your God. Also jumping over to Judges 9, 6. And all the men of Shechem gathered together in all the house of Milo and went and made Abimelech king by the plain of the pillar that was in Shechem. Okay, verse 5. And they journeyed, and, and the terror of God was upon the cities that were round about them, and they did not pursue after the sons of Jacob. So somehow the Lord had impressed upon the other communities near Shechem not to go after Jacob and to leave him alone. And I found a psalm to kind of help this uh, verse out, 14.5. Uh, they were there in great fear, for God is in the generation of the righteous. Uh, so God still found Jacob to be righteous, uh, even though uh, he made a lot of mistakes. <clears throat> okay, uh, back to Genesis 35, 6. So Jacob came to Lutz, which is in the land of Canaan, that is Bethel, he and all the people that were with him. And he, and he built there an altar and called the place E Bethel, because there God appeared unto him when he fled from the face of his brother. E Bethel, uh, that means, uh, El means actually God. So it's basically saying the God of Bethel. So here Jacob added El to the name, which changes it from the house of God to the God of the house of God. So it, I think it's kind of representing the fact that the house of God is there, but now God is with them. So that's what he's basically saying by saying El Bethel. And some verses on this over in Genesis 28, 13. Behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac. The land where thou liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. Going down to verse 19. And he called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of that city was called Lutz at first. And also Genesis 28, 22. And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house, and of all the, that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. 
I found this this whole uh, line. I think I mentioned it even back when we were first studying Genesis. Uh, uh, back when we were studying this area, how uh, these cities are all in a line. And when we get to the Millennium Kingdom, I think that all three of these cities are going to have significance when it comes to uh, the uh, the temple and the worship and where, and where Jesus is going to reign from. Okay, so Genesis 35, 8. But Deborah, Rebecca's nurse, uh, now now we shift gears a little bit, and they, and uh, here we have Moses just stuck this verse in here, but it kind of tells us a couple of things, and I think it's probably a uh, uh, kind of a way of letting us know that uh, remember when Jacob actually left, how his mother had said that uh, go away for a while until your brother cools off, and then come back again. Well, I mean that was over twenty years ago, and. I, his mother ended up passing away. And we find this out in this verse, uh, besides another verse we'll get to later. But here, Rebecca's nurse is actually living with Jacob and she actually passed away. So that uh, uh, this verse was actually tucked in here. And so I just mentioned, uh, but, Deborah's, but Deborah, Rebecca's nurse died and she was buried beneath Bethel under an oak. And the name of it was called Elon uh, Bekuth. But here we see that uh, the nurse that took care of Rebecca all the years that she was alive was now living with Jacob. So that uh, it's an indication that Rebecca had uh, passed away. And then now Deborah has passed away and she was buried here in, uh, in Bethel. And just one comment on that in Genesis 24, 59. <clears throat> And they sent away Rebecca, their sister, and her nurse, and Abraham's servant, and his men. So we can see here that uh, that uh, the nurse was uh, was tied to Rebecca until she passed away. So we see here Jacob never did see his mom again, as Rebecca's nurse, it appears, joined the family after her death, and now she also passed away. I'm sure for Rebecca that was nice to have a connection to his mom. Yeah. And probably found out things about her last days. We'll find out a little bit more about that when we get to uh, later, uh, when it talks about uh, some genealogies, I think it mentions her again. So that's all I had for today. Uh, I got a couple of pictures to show of this particular area. Let me get those up. pictures. They must have ended up in a different category. Where'd they go? It's in an area, it's in uh, Bethel, that they believe is the, uh, could be this area where uh, the, uh, where, where uh, Jacob had set up that, uh, it's a little building that, that's from that time frame and that uh, Jacob could have set up uh, and had available. And also it's shaped a little bit like what you see up in uh, uh, Haran with that dome on top. I thought I got some other pictures of it, but this is actually the hilltop where they believe that uh, that uh, Jacob first was meeting with God. And I thought I grabbed some more pictures, but I guess that was the only one. <clears throat> it's kind of a little bit shorter lesson today. But now they're in Bethel, and we will continue with this. And the next portion, uh, I was actually going to try to go all the way through verse 17 today, uh, but the next section is kind of separate. And I didn't think I would have enough time, and I probably don't. <clears throat> so we'll take care of that tomorrow. I may add to it. 
Because it talks about, because Jacob reflects back to the last time he was in Bethel. And uh, it's kind of a nice review of, our, of everything we've come up to so far. So I'll take a look at that tomorrow. <clears throat> Let's end with a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, oh, thank you. Thank you so much for this time uh, looking at your word. And uh, thank you, Lord, for this, uh, uh, for all that we uh, do. And that tonight will be a, a, a nice uh, a service and worship for you in our Wednesday evening service. And we give you all the praise and thanks. In Jesus' precious name, I pray. Amen. So I will see you all tonight. And uh, hope you have a great day. And see you later.